ES Audio. This is the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Hello, I'm Nick Curtis, the Standard's Chief Theatre Critic. I'm Nancy Durrant, Culture Editor. And I'm Nick Clark, the Deputy Culture Editor. Coming up, Sleepover by Matelda Feizeo Ibini. My dad's picking up at midnight. Ow, but you said. I me. know that I could come over, but not that I could stay over, but my mum was not having it. Okay, but did you try? I everything? tried everything in the plan. I gave them your mum's number, her email, her work address. They know she's a Christian. That's now on at the Bush Theatre. Very excited to talk about that later. Plus, we'll be joined by It's a Sin's Callum Scott Howells. Callum is currently performing in Romeo and Julie at the National Theatre alongside Rosie Sheehy. I really wanted to tell this story really truthfully because it, Romeo is so many people I know and, and and I know that I have to represent it in Wales, you know, like it, he's my friends, like yes. the boys that I bother with back home and that are my friends now and friends for life and I met in school, like Romy is some of them. But kicking things off, can we talk about Guys and Dolls? Let's talk about Guys and Dolls. <laughs> So we're going to discuss whether Luck was a lady for the uh, cast at the Bridge Theatre. This is Nicholas Heitner's semi-immersive staging of the 1950 Frank Lerza musical about gamblers and gals in the interwar years during Prohibition in New York, based on Damon Runyon's short stories. I say semi-immersive because a substantial portion of the audience is in amongst the action, which they're sort of in the pit of the Bridge Theatre and the set and the car sort of rise up amongst them. Two of those people were us, right, Nick? Those people were us. They were indeed, yes. You know, we we opted to stand or, you know, sort of wander about for two hours. Yeah. And 40 minutes rather than uh, take the weight of our legs, which which the rest of the audience uh, did, and indeed some some critics did, and they they seem to enjoy it fractionally less than the rest of us. Um, what did you think of this one, Nick? I'm got to admit I'm predisposed to this. In my musical origin story, <laughs> the. 90s production at the National Theatre directed by Richard Eyre was the first musical I saw that absolutely blew me away. I already like Damon Runyon stories. I love Guys and Dolls. And so going into this, it was always going to be one that I was looking forward to and it didn't disappoint. Yeah. This show is a knockout. Absolutely superb. It's two love stories, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, Two improbable love stories. One between Nathan Detroit, who is a fixer for an illegal gambling crap game. Um, Not a gambler himself, but he's the sort of guy who makes it happen. Well, He takes the the money off the top. He takes the money off. He skims off the top and the police are always after him. He's been engaged for 15 years to uh, (laughs) Miss Adelaide, who is a lounge singer. A scantily clad lounge singer, I think she'd be the first to admit, um, in, a, in a fairly dodgy club called The Hot Box. And the other love story is between Sky Masters and a high-rolling gambler and Sarah Brown, the sergeant in a Save a Soul mission, who are trying to redeem all the sort of lowlifes and gangsters around them. Sky and Sarah are the sort of romantic story. They get the big mm. uh, lush ballads, whereas, broadly speaking, Nathan and Adelaide are the comic story. Yes. But I think the beauty of Guys and Dolls is the way it merges those two things. And mm. it's, it's always constantly playing opposites off against each other. The suave sky and the rather seedy Nathan. Yeah. We've got to talk about the cast, the main yes. four char- the main four actors. I mean, let's, if we start with, with one of the relationships, so Daniel Mays and Marisha Wallace. Yeah. I mean, well, let's start with Marisha. She absolutely is extraordinary as Adelaide. I've seen a few Adelaides where it's played as sort of cutesy baby doll and while funny, it doesn't land home the sort of pathos of the character. Yes. Not here. I yeah. think she really brings it. She really adds nuance, but also the grit and a bit of the anger that you often don't see in that character. Yes. Yeah. And the singing. I mean, <laughs> just get your ticket for that alone. I mean, it is extraordinary. I think we should just give her all the singing awards right now. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's game over, really, and everyone else should just pack up and go home. She also has impeccable comic timing. Absolutely. Yeah, One yeah. thing, we always talk about this as, as being Frank Lurz's musical, but it has, the book was written by Joe Swirling and Abe Burrows, and the dialogue is just wonderful. Adelaide's lines are just are just brilliant. I love that mm. she's given a, a kitchen shower when she thinks she's about to get married by mm. all her female friends, and she says, I'm going to be so good in the kitchen, I've tried all the other rooms, yeah. which I just <laughs> think is lovely. She's obviously a star. She was wonderful in Oklahoma when that yeah. was put on at the Young Vic. She came out of the cast when that moved to the West End, so 
she could do this at the bridge. And, yeah, I mean, she just is absolutely steals the show. And then opposite her is Daniel Mays, who isn't a sort of traditional musical theatre actor. No. But what he really brings is he is a classic Nathan Detroit. He's got that sort of rumpled look. He looks like the fixer and still so charismatic with it. He is the sort of comic underpinning in a way. And yeah. I absolutely loved his performance. I mean, actually, in this show, the harder probably performances are the other two romantic yeah. leads because really they don't have the comedy. I mean, they have some funny lines in there, but not as sort of consistent as the, as um, Adelaide and Nathan Detroit. You're right. So uh, Sarah Brown is played by Celinda Schoenmacher. I believe I've got that right, mm-hmm. um, who has done her time in, uh, in musical theatre. She's done a couple Les of Mis. years. in Les Mis, Phantom, Phantom, I think she's yeah. been in as well. I thought there was a beautiful sort of clarity to her mm. singing and her acting. Mm. Uh, almost total newcomer, uh, Andrew Richardson. This yeah. is his professional stage debut. And you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it, would you? No. <laughs> Looks like he's been doing it for years. Yeah. You know, you think he'd been playing Sky for decades. He's terrific, isn't he? He's uh, absolutely superb. And again, just adds that extra depth. Sky Marston is a character that can go off and become a bit a bit sappier towards the end, but not with Andrew at the helm here. He really adds something to it. I just found all four really complimented each other. Yeah. You know, yeah. They each had their moments. Nicely Nicely Johnson is played by Cedric Neal, which is... Who has the great sort of gospel number? It's it is uh, it's the built-in showstopper in the show. Sit down, you're rocking the boat. Nicely Johnson is quite often seen as this big slob who gets his his moment sort of yeah. late on in late on in the day. I just think there's so much thought and attention to detail yeah. of every aspect of this show has gone in, and it's a show that you know, it doesn't need that much, but when it gets it, boy, does it sing even more. I thought about the, the, the immersive staging because they have the hustlers, the lowlifes, the people trying to save your soul, all weaving in amongst you. The stage is going up and down and you really feel part of it. It just adds to the energy of Broadway from the 1920s. It really does. The nice thing about the focus shifting all the time was when uh, Sky was singing Luck Be A Lady Tonight, he was singing mm. it at various points around the stage. He actually sang one line of it, um, a lady shouldn't leave her escort. Uh, he sang that to my wife and then turned to me and said, it isn't fair, it isn't right. I was like, yeah, absolutely, quite right too. Um, it's a sublime bit of direction from Nicholas Heitner. Yep, and uh, also absolutely working in tandem with designer Bunny Christie mm. and choreographer Dame Arlene Phillips, who's working with James Cousins on this. There was a slight snippiness. This has been programmed into the bridge for quite a long period mm. of time. It's obviously meant to be a money spinner. Mm. Um, and fair dues. Theatres are still, I think, suffering from the from the pandemic. The last thing that was at the bridge, John Gabriel Borkman by Ibsen, was probably not going to absolutely Couldn't be more different stuff rolling into the <laughs> coffers. But I think if you looked around that audience that, that we both saw, both the promenaders and the seated mm. people, all ages, lots and lots of different types of people, um, having an absolute whale of a time, and you can't argue with that. Just the sheer joy of it all. Yeah, yeah. Exhilarating and blissful. Viva guys and dolls. Viva guys and dolls. After the break, I'll be interviewing Callum Scott Howells. We reviewed Romeo and Julie and his rather wonderful performance in it in our previous episode. You can find that in this episode's show notes. So we'll be back after these ads. Tap that follow or subscribe button and tell your friends. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. I'm joined now by Callum Scott Howells, sometime star of It's a Sin and the MC in Cabaret, now appearing in Romeo and Julie at the National Theatre. Callum, welcome. How are you? Hi, Nick. Yes, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm really good. Nice to have you here. I could describe the play, but how would you describe Romeo and Julie to an audience coming to it cold? So I think the way I describe her, I describe her as like a sort of a rom-com set in splot with these two lovers, I guess, but people more than more than anything. For the English audience, we should say splot is a district in Cardiff. (laughs) Yes, yes. Yeah, it's this place uh, in Cardiff, which where Gary often likes to set his plays. This is Gary Owen, the author. Gary Owen, yeah, Gary Owen. Uh, you know, he wrote famous for Iphigen Iron Splot. Yes. Um, and now Romeo and Julie, which is his brand new play, which is also set in Splot. Um, a place where, you know, it's, it's a very interesting place in Cardiff because it's kind of nowadays, I guess, there are some kind of cool parts of Splot, but also there are also parts of Splot where are, it's quite deprived and there's a lot of poverty. 
So it tells the story of Romeo, who's a single dad, and he lives in Odell Street, and Julie, um, who lives in uh, Mordale Road, which is kind of streets that are 10 minutes apart. So these two people who have lived relatively close together, but... uh, come from kind of different backgrounds but kind of it's not it's not like she's rich he's poor it's almost like Julie is working class and Romeo is kind of almost an underclass yes. um, and he lives in sort of with his alcoholic mum Bob and they're really kind of fighting just to get by every day really yeah. whereas yeah. Julie her parents you know they both have jobs it's just very different to his his sort of surroundings and I think that's that's the story really and they fall in love and Julie has these aspirations of going to Cambridge the question is whether she's going to get involved with this young lad who has a baby daughter Mm -hmm. um, isn't it Um, and events spiral from there I won't put any spoilers on the plot but I'd say it's inspired by Romeo and Juliet rather than based on wouldn't you it's definitely leaps off into a into a very different area yeah he's also sort of effectively a carer to his mum, isn't he? A sort of yeah. parent to his mother. I was very interested in the physicality of your performance. Um, really? There seemed to be a tension in your in your body on stage, yes. sort of suggesting that uh, yeah. the, the, all the things that basically he was bearing on his shoulders. It's yeah, it's, it's so interesting, right? Because I had a couple of people say this to me since seeing the show about the, the physicality of the role. I'm never aware of it as an actor, you know? I, I think what happens is when, when I'm rehearsing the play like this... And I guess it also happened with Carberry, the, the play I did before this, is that when I'm when I'm sort of playing the circumstances of each scene, I think when you play it truthfully and like the way we did it with Rachel, and this is the way Rachel often likes to work. This is the director, Rachel O'Riordan. Riordan, yes, who is also um, AD of the Lyric Hammersmith. Yes. Um, it was, she really wants to examine every detail. So, you know, for example, there's a scene that takes place in the play, as you know, Nick, where Romy is there and and he's he wants to go on a night out with Julie. He's, he's going to, and they've agreed that Barb will come home and look after Neve whilst he's out. But Bob comes home drunk. Obviously, the problem is then he can't. He doesn't want to let Bob look after Neve alone whilst drunk because anything can happen. Yeah. So you know, like that that scene in particular, I found sort of so hard to play because I'm I'm dealing with my mother and also the problem of wanting to go and see this girl that I'm and I'm be, I'm able to have a night out with her on my own. You know. Yeah. So I, that's one part where I I feel particularly tense and it's just so interesting like people can pick up on that and I, and I just it's just interesting to kind of hear really because I, I always find that like I, it's not it's never enough I always go like oh am I, am I is it is of the people are people going to understand Romy's tension here but it's actually nice that you've said that because it's cool to to know that you know yeah. <laughs> I don't know that my job is I don't know I'm doing my job right. I guess so, well done <laughs> job well done um, it's very funny and it's quite romantic as well as dealing with very serious issues it's also part of uh, the policy of the artistic director of the National Theatre Roof Norris to enter into co-productions with regional theatres, in this case the Sherman Theatre in mm. Cardiff, which Rachel O'Riordan previously ran and yeah. where she had a, an established relationship with Gary Owen, the Welsh playwright, didn't, mm. didn't she? I think this is feeding in very interestingly into the, the sort of ecology of the National Theatre and therefore into London Theatre, mm. that you've got that tie-up with the Sherman at the moment. You've also got the tie-up with Sheffield Theatres with We're standing, standing on the sky's, the sky's edge in the mm. other auditorium at the National. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, we uh, yeah, does it feel good to be bringing a bit of Welsh culture? Oh into the capital it's the dream like it's, it's, it's things that I only ever wanted to do as an actor when I was young because I love telling Welsh stories more than anything I love being able to sort of play Welsh characters and show four dimensional Welsh characters on stage mm. and, and screen but particularly on stage because it's so cool because it's there and it's, and it's in front of an audience in the capital of of um, of England which is really cool um, and I feel very lucky to be doing it especially at the National you know it's a, it's a place that I've been going to ever since I was a young boy I saw some of the best theatrical experiences I've ever had. Yes. So to be there now, telling this story feels particularly important. And also, like you said, to be in a co-production with the Sherman, opening it at the National and getting, you know, lovely reviews that we've been lucky to have and also having lovely audience reactions and now knowing that we're taking it to Cardiff and knowing that we have something great and we're bringing it home is something really cool and it feels like a proper... Um, success story, and, it's, and I'm, I'm not taking uh, responsibility. For that. I'm taking, I'm saying it on behalf of me and the team, and, sure. and Rachel and Gary. Like we feel very, very proud of this piece, and we're Absolutely. so excited to take it 
to the motherland. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, you, going there as a, as a boy. I mean, you, you started your career very early. You were on uh, presenter on children's television in your teens. Mm. You were on Britain's Got Talent as part of a choir, and I believe beaten by Pudsy the Dog. My dog, yes. Thanks well, for mentioning that, yes, Nick. Yes, okay. I'm sure you're not bitter about it anymore. <laughs> I'm so bitter. <laughs> Um, and uh, you were still at drama school when you were picked to appear in It's a Sin, the Russell T. Davis uh, mm. series about um, what happened to the gay community in the 80s, effectively. Yeah. Uh, that must have been an extraordinary experience. Yeah, filming It's a Sin. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I, I, It was so formative for me. I learned so much about uh, myself as an actor and about sort of really just being thrown in the deep end, really, and being part of a show that, w- that we knew was very important from the off. And we had a responsibility to tell this story very honestly and truthfully and I loved it and I learned so much and I think it's really informed my work now going forward you know like for example like Romeo and Julie you know like not just the, the work I do but the way I sort of attack it you know mm. like playing Romeo I really wanted to tell this story really truthfully because it, Romeo is so many people I know and 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 I know that I have to represent it in Wales you know like it, he's my friends like yes. the boys that I I bother with back home and that are my friends now and friends for life and I met in school like Romy is some of them so like doing it to sin has really taught me how to really take responsibility for the role and not just sort of give a wish-washy generalised character and really sort of examine every detail and and Russell was a big part of that as well because he's you know his writing is so brutally honest and I think you said as well that there's quite a lot of Colin in you that you were quite similar to the character at the the start out or you know certainly quite sort of shy and naive in the way that character was yeah oh gosh absolutely when I first came to London at 16 when I did a show you you know that's that's how I was I kind of I as much as I thought I was confident when I came up to London which is very different to the South Wales valleys yeah. I you know I felt very I really was out of my depth really in terms of like the people I was meeting they were so comfortable in themselves and they knew how to express themselves in every way and me I wasn't I wasn't fully formed yet I was yes. <laughs> you know <laughs> I was just a little sort of caterpillar I guess soft shell I hadn't actor, bloomed yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so it was uh, it was really that's how I was and yeah so Colin in many ways I really identified with him you know I've you know I've said it before but some of those scenes I really wasn't acting like mm. some of those scenes like it, it felt so like close to the bone that I sort of just was kind of living in it for those times it was cool I believe your co-star Neil Patrick Harris became obsessed with the way you say beautiful and given <laughs> this is radio yes. I think we have to get you to say beautiful oh beautiful isn't yes. that lovely <laughs> <laughs> Always. He yeah. was, he'd, he'd never used like a proper Welsh accent, mm. which is obviously like my Valley's accent. You can't get more proper, really. It's taken so, me back. I did my journalism training in Cardiff. I oh, lived did in you? Cates for a year with a, with a bunch of At Welsh Cardiff guys. Uni? So, yeah. Um, but you went from uh, It's a Sin into Cabaret, playing the MC, another sort of stonking part to take yeah. on at a relatively young age. At the age of, what, 20 or 21 you were at the time, had to anchor that whole thing? Yeah. Well, I, I, I was 20... 20 how old was I? 23. 23. I was 23. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm to, I thought you were... That's okay. No, no, no. Thank you. That's a compliment. Shave, shave off a couple of years. Just accept it. <laughs> yes, all let's through... stick... Actually, let's stick with 21. <laughs> We've all been through the pandemic. We can all take back a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, we can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I was, yeah, I was 20, 23 playing it. Even still, you like it being 23 and playing the MC, you know, I was very scared I, because part of me was very aware that I'm, pl- I'm going to play the MC now in this production and I was I was almost quite aware that I probably wouldn't play it again in another production because I've, I've done this now and so I was, I was sort of considering that before I played it and I was very much going am I ready um, but you know I met Rebecca Frecknell who's the director of the show and, and uh, Jen who's the MD and all the creative team and you know wh- when I started rehearsals I very much then was like I really really feel like I'm ready to do this like I feel like I'm ready to kind of give this a go and yeah. give my interpretation of it and, and I loved it I, I really felt looked after and I was able to express myself freely with the character and you know the creative team of the show because obviously I'm you know I was going into a pre-existing production Eddie Redmayne originated it I was really able to kind of create the character from scratch yeah. and that was very much the case you know we, we they, they redesigned the costumes we even redid numbers like re-examined them so like two ladies the version I did was a brand new version for the show right. and you know we really got to like really make it sexual and really examine all the sex that's in it because you know it is set in a sex club so I really wanted to bring that to her and I also wanted to bring you know the sort of what Germany is hurtling towards within that time and that's you know they are heading towards a dictatorship yes. f- with a man who is absolutely 
he's mad. And and I think I really wanted to kind of look at that. And because obviously, like, it's set in sort of the turn of the decade. So it's 1929 into 1930. So Hitler still hasn't sort of risen to power yet, but he's there and he's, he's within Germany. We know what's coming. Yeah. And I think sort of being able to look at that and also whilst being within the Kit Kat Club it, it, it was a recipe for something really cool it's a very powerful um, combination in that show isn't yes. it? the sort of uh, the, the chemical mix of that show is very subtle and very very, very yeah. clever and very potent I very think. cool yeah. yeah I'm glad you say so because there's, yeah. there's kind of a sort of uh, and it's a sin repertory company on our stages this year <laughs> there is because Amari Douglas is going into a little life isn't yes he, at uh, the Pinto having uh-huh. previously done uh, Clifford in Cabaret in Cabaret and, and Constellations yeah and Mm-hmm. Lydia West is coming uh, to, the to the Barbican, Barbican to do uh, the, this pioneering example of eco theatre. Are yeah. you still mates? Do you consult? Do you sort of ring each other and go, got this gig? You know, got this. We do. We have a group chat. Well, Amari and Lydia in particular, they're my best friends in the world. Yeah. And we talk a lot. I'm so proud of them and everything they're doing. And, you know, it's just so great. And, you know, the, the play Lydia's doing sounds epic. And also a little life is obviously going to be tremendous we know yeah. that for a fact so i feel so proud of their work i and, and i i love them dearly so I, you can you can bet your bottom dollar that i'll be there <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> for sure and yeah it's, it's cool isn't it though it's, i feel very proud of us because it's one thing you know to do it to sin and be on on screen but it's also another thing to then be on stage and you know sort of really try and be as equally successful on stage yes. it's a very different medium so Absolutely. i feel very proud of us as a team because they're they're just amazing and i love them very dearly great That was Callum Scott-Pells, star of Romeo and Julie at the National Theatre. Callum, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Nick. Thank you very much. Coming up, we review Sleepover at the Bush Theatre. If you're enjoying the show and want to hear more, hit the follow button and rate. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. Now we're going to talk about Sleepover by Matilda Feyazeo Ibini at the Bush Theatre. You loved this one, didn't you? I love this one. I think you loved this one. We I were did. we were actually at the theatre that same night, yeah. which is a fairly rare occurrence. And uh I think everybody who was there loved it, didn't oh they? Oh, my God, that audience was just <laughs> whooping. It was so nice. Yeah. This is a play about a sleepover. Yeah, exactly. It's basically four black girls in East London aged about... 15, 16 at the start, going up to, I think, around the time of A-levels. It's sort of 16 to 18. It effectively starts on a 16th birthday sleepover, doesn't it? They all get together for a sleepover to celebrate Shan's 16th birthday, I believe, don't they? Exactly. And uh, they're millennials, so they are 16 in 2016. They are 18 in 2018. And I'm not giving much away if they say at the end of the play, we're looking forward to a great 2019. Oh, boy. (laughs) Oh, well, (laughs) yeah, good luck, girls. Um, but we see them sort of navigate grief and health issues. Shan has um, sickle cell disease, uh, parental relationships and love of kind of all kinds, really. Um, Absolutely. Various, Sexuality of all kinds. They, yeah. they sort of explore, don't they? Exactly. Well. And, and at various kind of sleepovers, sort of sleepovers, like, I kind of feel like the sleepover conceit she sort of lets it slide a little bit towards yeah. the end. I think it's a bit, but uh, some which of the houses, which is fine, which is which totally is fine because you don't need to stick to it. You know, you just they just get together. They get yeah. together in homes. They're never anywhere else except when they go to prom, which is a really fantastic scene. I yeah, think. Yeah, great scene. Um, but yeah, I adored it. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was. It's very specific to the um, millennial young black female experience and that friendship. And and the East London experience. And East they London, don't actually yes. know how Chiswick is pronounced. No, yeah, oh God, that was brilliant. <laughs> but it's it's also really universal in the, you know, the, the way that teenage girls interact and joke and profess love and support and compete, often within the same conversation. That felt so authentic and natural to me. I absolutely agree. I I, I think the, the wonderful thing about this was the, the naturalness of, mm. of it and the looseness of it in mm. some ways. Every single performance of this is being done as a relaxed performance. So yeah. people are invited to respond to the play respectfully, but in any way that they wish. They're invited to come and go as they please. I don't recall seeing anyone come and go the night we were both no. there. But the wave of appreciation and enjoyment and savour coming off that audience uh, was extraordinary that night. Yeah, there was actually quite a famous playwright in the front row, um, uh, just in front of me, who was like, oh, no, like this at certain points. And kind of really, she'd really taken to heart the way, that that way of responding. And she was just, and in a way, I sort of felt like she might 
be leading it like, deliberately because I think she wanted to allow people to be excited. It was quite, yeah. it was nice. Yeah. Um, Ages ago, I, I remember writing in a review of a different play that the bush felt like the only play where you could hear sort of the London voices in all their yeah. multifarious uh, And I think it's true of this one. You were quite right. It's absolutely true here. Um, they're, they're all of, um, of different heritages, aren't they, as well? Yeah. There's a strong Nigerian Yoruba tradition yep. running through the play. Yeah, I think for Funmi is the sort of strongest, um, closest yep. to that for yep. her. Absolutely. Um, uh, there's also a big sort of Christian thing going on between yep. them as well, isn't it? Which, again, you you rarely see this sort of stuff discussed on stage. Yeah, and in it's such true. a natural way. It's just a part of their upbringing, um, which they're grappling with alongside all these, all these other things. Yeah, um, it just feels... You know, unlike actually the play that we talked about last week, Trouble in Butte Town, yeah. this is kind of an interesting comparison because I feel like the brilliance of the writing and indeed the acting in this play, in Sleepover, you almost don't notice it because it's so natural and you forget that you're watching a play in the way that you just didn't, you know, at the Donmar. You know, I don't want to underestimate the skill in that. I want, you know, people need to know. I, to me, increasingly... I think the mark of a successful show is is you sort of disappearing into it mm. and forgetting yourself a little bit, yeah. but you know, not that they are in the theater. Yes, and I, 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 this is just it's so so brilliant. I think all the more remarkable again in that three out of the four are making their stage debuts here. A lot of attention focused on Bucky Bakray, who uh, came to prominence through the film Rocks. She yeah, was plucked from school to appear in Rocks. So. Yeah, and by the way, if you haven't seen Rocks. Seek it out. She is fantastic in this, but she is absolutely equaled by yeah. uh, by the other three on stage with her. Of the of the others, Alia Adolfin is the only one who's ever. I think she's been in one play before. Yeah, they've all had screen credits, but they're just extraordinary. But Shade Sinclair, I think, is still at drama school. She is still at drama it's school. Amazing. That's absolutely right. Yes. Um, and, and they convince as um, not just as individuals, but as a group as well, don't yeah. they? The dynamics are so well observed. They this. really are. They're I'd, just. They're just. They're just. You fall in love with them and their lives it's it's really super yeah it's also it's directed by jade lewis who's a name i wasn't particularly familiar with she's yeah. got quite a track record as a sort of associate or an assistant director but you know she's uh produced something extraordinary here yeah, I think, in I, conjunction with the writer and the cast it's really incredible and you know i think you make such a good point in your review and, and earlier about about the fact that there is there feels like there is no other theater in london where work of this kind particularly of this kind of linguistic authenticity you know yeah. the london the uh, voices uh, and the and the the, the multi ethnic voices and just the, literally the kind of the the slang not all of which I understood I'm not going to lie mm, but that yeah. you know you get the gist it doesn't matter I, yeah. mean, I think my parents might struggle a little bit but <laughs> it doesn't matter at all I feel like the team running the bush is young and they are plugged into what young people are doing and thinking and saying and how they say it which suggests to me you know we know we've probably mentioned it before that the the uh, sort of artistic directorships of a lot of London theatres are about to change. Yes, you know, a there's a bit of a merry-go-round yes, about yes. to happen. And I sort of feel like those theatres need to be thinking quite hard about how they structure their senior artistic teams going forward and how they're going to tap this vein of really talented fresh blood yes in ter both in terms of creative work and in terms of audiences actually mm. i don't i mean i'm not saying i think that you know all the theaters like the donmar and and uh, hampstead and like all of these places that are that are changing should sort of just suddenly go into the hands of 20 year olds that's not what i mean but i do think that there is a better balance to be struck yes rather than just a kind of like oh who are the big who are the big people who've done well, who deserve an artistic directorship? Yet, who yes, yes, you know, it's sort yeah. of like, let's just take a moment and think about even if those people do get involved, can we also find a way, you know, to get younger, hungrier, more exciting, frankly, voices and people yeah. involved so that we get not just the kind of like commercial, let's make some money from the old people who see theatre Set, but yes. also, you know, making this kind of thing happen because it's so exciting. It is so exciting. Actually, one thing I would like to say, and I'm sure you agree with this, is that it's, it's also really funny. Yes. It's so amusing. You quoted a couple of great lines in your review, like when Elle pervs over Shan's brother. What does she say? <laughs> all over him like Jesus' love for mankind. Oh, I mean, no, I it's just the place just collapsed at that point from what I remember. And which also, follows on from the other character saying I'd be all over him like cocoa butter. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. Yeah. And also I like 
Um, when Shan gets asked out by a boy, Funmi just she sort of immediately she kind of looks up and she's like counting on her fingers like Ray, you know, Anthony. He is the sixth pengest boy we know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. It just it rang so true. It like is yes, brilliant. we do. We are teenage girls and we have a ranking. Yeah, and all the little sort <laughs> and of we slanging all know and teasing it. about you're really beautiful. It's not your fault. You've got no edges. You know, yeah, things like that. It's just <laughs> so it's great. really lovely. I think yeah, really, really, really lovely. I think this is is. Yeah, I I think anyone would enjoy this, and I think that everyone should go and see it. I agree. It'd be wonderful if it had a. I mean, it sits perfectly in the bush, but it'd be wonderful if it had a future life. Wouldn't yeah. It? Well, fingers crossed. Producers, I think you should get involved. Yep. Second that entirely. That's it for this week's episode of the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. I'm Nick Curtis. I'm Nancy Durrant. And I'm Nick Clark. We'll be back next Sunday. Make sure you hit rate, follow, and leave us a review. See you soon.